Thank you. All right, yes. Uh, my name is Beth. I'm from the Watershed Ecology Center. We are part of USC Upstate. Eventually, they may reprogram me to say that the way they want to, but <laughs> it just doesn't come out right yet. So I am from USC Upstate. I work with the Watershed Ecology Center. Most of what we do is outreach programs for kids. We go into the schools that are serviced by Spartanburg County Water System. They are one of our major funders. They have an educational component to what they do, and we help cover that. So we go into schools and do free or very inexpensive programs for the kids. They're on the standards that their teachers are teaching anyway, but all of ours are wrapped around water in some way, shape, or form and have a hands-on component to it. And that's what most of our educators do. I work with adults and um, get to teach about anything that happens in a watershed, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. So thank you for coming out. Okay, this is supposed to go right way. So first of all I want to thank our sponsors. Um, Spartanburg Water is one of our major ones but we're also sponsored by other water districts. Do I have Greer on here? Yes. Greer CPW is new to us and so we're branching out into the Greer um, area as well. Um, City of Spartanburg, Spartanburg County, Woodruff Roebuck Water District, SJWD, Blue Ridge Rural Water, and then we do have several anonymous donors that help to fund our programming as well. All the supplies for our hands-on activities are um, kind of, they get used up and so they have to be replenished. And then we do house several animals at the center which we take in as part of our programming and they need to be fed and cleaned and all that kind of stuff too. So we appreciate these people. Also to the opossums pouch, this is the rescue that I work with and um, they help out with a lot of rehab type stuff in this area. They're based out of Greenville. Um, quick plug, if you are interested in any part of rehab at all, they're having a class on Saturday in Greenville. I can get the address for you, but they'll teach you how to tube feed babies and all this stuff and we'll find out more about rehab later on, but that class is Saturday if anybody is interested. So, an opossum. I've got my outline here that will keep me on track because otherwise I'll just start talking about all kinds of stuff about opossums. So, I'm going to try to stick with what I'm supposed to be talking about so I don't get ahead of myself. So, I'm from the Watershed Ecology Center. What does that have to do with opossums? First of all, what is a watershed? A watershed is the area of land that all the water that falls on it goes to one particular point. So if you think about this like your bathtub at home, <coughs> excuse me a second, while the sirens are going. Your bathtub at home, when you turn the shower on, all the water in theory is going to hit the walls of your shower and go down the drain, right? If you open that shower curtain, some of it goes outside of your shower on the floor. That would be a separate watershed. Everything that's going down the drain from your shower is one watershed. So we've got water that falls on these little mountain peaks. They go down through here and they all eventually drain into the ocean here. Anything that's inside that watershed, we can teach on in the Watershed Ecology Center. Pretty broad field, right? So possums live somewhere in this habitat, they're part of a watershed, therefore I can do a possum program and that's how it all fits together. <laughs> that's not a big stretch, I've done better. <laughs> I can stretch it pretty far. So one of a kind, yes, possums really are one of a kind. North America has very varied wildlife, we've got all kinds of stuff out there, but these are our only marsupials. So what is a marsupial? First of all, it's a mammal. We're mammals too, but we're not very similar. So like us, possums have fur or hair. Y'all have got that, right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, live birth, nobody hatched from an egg, did you? Okay, good. Sometimes there's one, worries me a little bit. Um, Warm-blooded, my husband thinks I am cold-blooded, but really I am warm-blooded. I'm hot all the time. Poor man, we, after we got married, we moved to Vermont. And he kept saying, man, this bedroom's cold. Man, the bedroom's cold. There's a big dip in the snow outside the window. I had the top open so he couldn't tell that I had the window <laughs> open all winter. But he's wearing a hat to bed. Um, they nurse their young. They have a backbone. These are all characteristics of a mammal. But marsupials have something different. 
They have no placenta. The placenta is what goes from mom to help feed baby while baby is developing inside. And this is because possum babies do not develop inside. They develop outside. So this is a newborn opossum right here. See how tiny that is? This is a finger, well, a thumb and a finger. So basically when they're born, they're a little fetus with feet. So they're like a little lima bean with front feet. See how well developed those are compared to everything else? They use those little front feet to climb up into the pouch and then they hang out there. So here's a whole bunch of little beans inside a pouch. They hang out there until it's time for them. Let's see if I can make this go. Where's my little... I gotta turn the sound off because somebody starts talking through it and we don't really need to hear them. Oh, you want to stand up or off? Off, I just got to turn it off. There we go. So they're inside the pouch and they're just little teeny. They're wiggling around in there. And what they do is they crawl into the pouch and mom has 13 teats inside, six on each side, one in the middle. They crawl up, they grab onto one of those and basically swallow it. And once that happens, their mouth, that little teeny tiny mouth seals up around it and they are in there. They're done. So that's how... Um, they are different because there's no placenta and they are born teeny tiny and then grow up inside the pouch as opposed to inside the body. So a lot of times we get people that call the rescue and they say, I've got this opossum. It's probably, I don't know, it's just a couple of weeks old because they're used to looking at like a baby bunny or a baby kitten where the development is done inside mom and then once they're born they're already kind of old compared to a possum so this is birth to one week they are just little teeny tiny pink guys moving around at this point they're very hard to rehab um, we have raised a couple from seven grams but it's really hard to do. Once they get to be 10 to 15 grams, that's doable. And so it's still teeny tiny, but it's doable. So that's a week to two weeks old. If you think of a kitten that's a week to two weeks old, they're a lot further along than this little guy right here. Everybody can still hear me okay, right? Okay. Um, two to three weeks old. These guys, 15 to 20 grams, they're getting a little bit bigger. They're starting to have like black where you can see where their fur is going to come in. Then um, four to five weeks old, a little bit bigger yet. At this point, when we get them in for rehab, these guys are no sweat. You're going, yep, I can do this. When they get to be six to seven weeks old, these guys are starting to have fur. They're real dark at first. Their eyes are not quite open yet, but they may be popping open. And once the little eyeballs pop open, they are the cutest little buggers you have ever seen. And so then, um, okay, eight to nine weeks old. If you think of a like two two month old kitten, that's not even a teeny kitten anymore, right? I mean, we adopted our, one of our cats from the shelter at um, two months old, and it was kind of old. So here's what these guys are. They just barely have their eyes open and are moving around. At this point, um, we're no longer tube feeding them. Well, we're kind of still tube feeding them, but they're learning to lap formula on their own. And so at this point, they've got a transition to make with us where they go from lapping from tube feeding to lapping. If they're with mom, they would definitely still be um, drinking milk from mom. By 10 to 12 weeks old, look how cute these little guys are. Are they not adorable? Um, they're, <laughs> they're so cute. They're starting to run in a wheel. You go in to feed them and they're all happy because you're feeding them. And there's just all these little pink noses and black beady eyes everywhere. They're really, really cute. Um, 13 to 20 weeks old, they're finally starting to look like a possum. And so this is like newborn kitten age right here. And by this time, they're already 20 weeks old. So they kind of start off way earlier than everybody else. So that's about, um, and then when we release, we release around three pounds. So we've still got a ways to go from 450 grams to three pounds, but that's just an idea of how old they are. Here's a little stinking cute one right here. Any age of this one? Um, he's a little over a pound. 
a little over a pound. We don't have that the same kind of Sarah's liver. I'm not sure. Oh, really? Hers are that big now? No, yeah, hers are a little bit smaller. Okay. But they're all, one's over 300 grams, and they're all over 200 gallons. So, so about 14-ish weeks, maybe? 14, 15 weeks old? Okay. So... Where are they? This map shows where possums are in the world right now. Let me make sure I'm comparing it. Yeah, okay. Where are they? This is a map of where they are now. They're a little bit more widespread in North America. They're moving into other places because of lack of habitat. They're trying to find other places to live. But in North America, we've got our one and only marsupial. And this is the, the little possums that we have. South America has got a lot of different kinds of marsupials. Australia, it's like 80% of their mammals are marsupials. There are 250-ish species worldwide. We've got one in North America. So it's pretty special, but for some reason, people just don't see opossums that way. That's why we're here today, is to try to change that. Um, most of the, the marsupials that you're used to seeing, the kangaroos, the wombats, all that kind of stuff, are prodontia. <coughs> and that means two front teeth. Possums also have two front teeth, but the ones that we have are a little bit different. We'll get into their taxonomy in just a minute. Anything else I'm supposed to tell you about this? Nope, got them all. Okay, so this is where they are now. This is where they were. Opossums are one of the oldest mammal species. They're back from the Cretaceous period, so about 65 million years ago. There are possums walking around that look very similar to the ones that we have walking around today. I have a picture of a fossilized possum somewhere, and for some reason it's not in my PowerPoint. I have to find it and put it in there. <coughs> but it looks very, very much like the possums that we have today, even in the fossil record. So they've been around a long time, and um, one of the oldest mammal species, people look at them and go, man, these guys are crazy. They've got a short lifespan. They've got crazy adaptations. Apparently it works because they've been around that long. And uh, there were more species and different spread out, but Australia still has the market on them. Yes? How do you recognize <coughs> uh, that Africa doesn't have them? Just how it is. Yeah, wow. There's not any there now. Just however they came over and what they do and how they can survive. I believe Africa is probably just too hot and dry for, for them, depending on where they are. I know some parts are real wet, but they've got other animals that fill those niches. So, have you guys seen Mythbusters? Okay, so we're going to start off and talk about some myths that you may or may not have heard about opossums. Does anybody have a myth they've heard about opossums? All right, I'll go and you can tell me if you've heard this one, okay? Have you heard that opossums hang by their tails? How many of you have heard that one? Yeah. Okay, opossums do not actually hang from their tails. That would be a lot of weight on their little backbone. When they're babies, some, they, they can because their body's not as heavy. But what they use their tail for is for balance. If you see them walking on a fence, that little tail's just going all over the place, keeping them balanced. They use it to climb down trees, kind of like another hand, just give them a little support. But this is the main thing they use them for. You're going to love this. Where's my little pointer guy? All right, I better just do it on here. Let me get rid of the sound because they talk on this one too. <laughs> I'm going to bet that most of you have probably never seen that. I saw last night. You saw last night? Oh my God. What are they doing? They are carrying stuff for their bedding in their tail. Oh. And so even in captivity, they will take their little, their feet, their little back feet, and they'll squinch up a blanket and so that they can get it with their tail. They wrap their tail around it, carry it all over the house and stuff. Um, this one, not so much. She does, I mean, you can see she can hang on with that, but she doesn't have enough in her little head so that she would carry stuff with it. But, um, okay, let go. <laughs> but as a rehabber, if a possum does not have enough of a tail, we can't release them because this is something that they need to have in order to survive in the wild. Is, did it start over again? 
Was it done? Uh-uh. Look at that cute little face. Anyway, but um, they do need to have that tail. They do use it for stuff that you have probably never thought of before. But that's one of the things that makes them an amazing species is they've got different characteristics. All right, uh, you're cute, but we'll move on. Where's my clicker? So busted, they don't actually hang from their tails. I have people all the time that coach me. Oh, I have possums that live in my backyard. I see them all hanging from the tree by their tail in the tree. And you're just going, okay, that's great. But they really don't. It, it would not be good for their backs. They can do it like for a couple seconds to get somewhere or if they fall and they happen to grab on, but they don't sleep hanging on with their tail. So that myth is busted. Now this one, I had never heard before. They breed through their noses. Has anybody heard that? <coughs> I don't, well, I can't tell where that one came from. Um, part of the reason that our possums are Didelphus virginii, and this means double wombed from the east. And so opossum anatomy is kind of crazy. They do have two wombs, and the boys have two corresponding other parts. And so when the mom is going to have the babies, and the babies are ready to come, she'll lick a little path up to her pouch, and apparently they thought that the babies were, they were bred through their nose because they've got two nostrils and that the babies came back out their nose and that's how they got into the pouch. Is that not crazy? I thought that was pretty wild. But, and here's the two front teeth you can see in this picture real well. And that's what the other um, marsupials that we're used to thinking about, the wombats and stuff like that, are all in that family. So... <coughs> I guess that didn't break anybody's thoughts. That one's busted. Opossums adapt and have plenty of habitat. Well, this one's true and false. It is true that they adapt. They are extremely adaptable, as can be told by how long they had been around from being around since the Cretaceous period. They can do some serious adapting to their environment. However, when they interact with people or where people live, this is where we get into trouble. How many of you have actually seen a live opossum? How many of you have seen a dead one on the road? <laughs> Everybody. So what happens is these little guys are doing just fine in their habitat that looks like this, but when they bump up against where people are is when we run into trouble. They are not designed to have cars as a predator. It's just not something that's in their mindset. And so they just kind of come walking out following their nose and they're not paying attention to this car thing. And so they run into trouble that way. Um, they end up in your yard and, and with your cat food and stuff like that because they were there first. Then somebody put it in a neighborhood. They're adaptable. They're still there. So they'll find something to eat. They're just looking for that food, water, shelter space that they need. And if it happens to come from your garage... They were there first, and so here we are now in their habitat. But the more habitat that we cut down and is diminishing, I mean, everywhere you look now, there's these little um, subdivisions and stuff popping up. That's less habitat. So the less habitat they have, the more they've got to move into where you are to try to find that food, water, shelter, space that they need. So that is fact and busted some because... They do run into cars and stuff like that, but they are extremely adaptable. This one, opossums are mean and scary. You probably heard that a lot, right? Yeah. They hiss and growl and all that kind of stuff. Look at that little mouth. So first of all, the reason they get this bad rap is look at all those teeth. They have got 50 teeth, which is more than any other land mammal, and so it looks scary. But in reality, these guys are really kind of shy. They're really just hoping that you're going to leave them alone. When I get Layla back out, for those of you that haven't seen her yet, these guys are not fast. They cannot see very well. They're kind of like a little fat meal on four feet if you're a coyote. And so they're just hoping that you're going to see this and leave them alone. Just, just leave me alone, that's all I want. And that's what they're hoping for. They really don't have a huge set of defenses. So they hiss and growl, and inside they're terrified. They're hoping you're just going to leave them alone. Um, many times I have walked up to a cornered, injured male possum that's probably 15, maybe 20 pounds, hiss and growl and doing the whole head thing. You walk up to them, put a hand on them, and they do this. 
Because <laughs> they're done. That's it. That's all they've got. I mean, <laughs> that's it. That's, that's all they can do. And so um, they are not very mean. They're just hoping that you will go away. And um, they're not going to attack your child or your dog or your chickens or any of that stuff. If you have, I have chickens. I have never had a chicken that was attacked by an opossum. Here's the deal with that. If you have chickens, something's going to get in there unless you build your chicken coop real well. Our chicken coop has got, uh, it's a chain link fence. It's got a net over the top. We've got an electric fence around it. And then we've got hardware cloth kind of on the bottom so nothing can dig in. I don't have anything bothering my chickens. But if something can get in there, it will, and it's probably not going to be an opossum. It's probably going to be a raccoon. And so what happens is raccoon gets in there, takes what it wants, and then little opossum wanders in and gets caught cleaning up afterward. That's usually what happens. So they're not going to jump up and attack anybody. They're just hoping that you will leave them alone. So that myth busted. Possums play dead. Heard that one? Yeah. This is true. They do play dead. But this is not like a, they're laying there on the ground going, are they gone yet? Are they gone yet? <laughs> this is actually like a comatose state that their body goes into, like the fainting goats. They're just kind of flopped over and they are done. Their heart rate is lowered. Their respirations are lowered. They have anal sacs. This is a great fun little bit of trivia, like cats and dogs and stuff like that. And when they play dead, they squirt stuff out of there. So they not only look dead, but they smell smell dead and uh, they, they really do it as bad and uh, they'll sit there with their mouth open and a little tongue hanging out their eyes kind of rolled back in some and they really look and smell dead and we have had people call us and they're going somebody threw away a perfectly good possum there's a possum in a trash bag and I don't know what to do well what happened is somebody thought that possum was dead and put it in a trash bag and then it came back from um, playing dead its body came back around and there it is. They don't just do this for fun. It is kind of taxing on their bodies, but it is a good defense mechanism. It works well against dogs and things in the dog families. Cars, not so much. So um, <laughs> that one is true. Anything else I was supposed to say about that one? No, okay. Yes? What should you do if you see a possum like that? Just leave? Um, if it's in a safe place, just leave it. Just leave it. If it's in the middle of a road, kindly move it out of the road. <laughs> but if it's in a safe place, um, if you have dogs and you know that you've got possums that come in your yard, if you bang a pan or something before you let the dog out, give them a little time to shuffle out of your yard, things like that will be helpful. But yeah, put it somewhere safe and it'll come back around whenever it's ready. So that one is fact. Next one. I hear this one all the time. I have possums that dug in underneath my shed and they're tearing the place apart. I don't know what you have, but it's not a possum. Possum feet are not designed for digging. They don't dig anything. They're designed for holding on and for climbing. So things that dig, um, the possum will happily take over that burrow after somebody else has moved in or moved out. They'll take it away and live under there. They don't like scratch your paneling down or any of that kind of stuff. If they are in a trap, they will try to chew out of that trap. But they are not destructive by nature because it doesn't fit with what they do in life. They're not animals that would typically live in an enclosed space. And so being in a trap scares them off. They're not animals that are necessarily predators. So they're not going in to find stuff, therefore ripping stuff apart. They're scavengers. So they're just not designed as destructive animals, which... Um, I have some at the house, so it's kind of nice. But they're not digging that hole. Something else dug it. They have moved in. The other one I get is, it's under there making all kinds of noise. You have a raccoon. You don't have a possum. They're very quiet. So that one's busted. All right. Possums are dirty. Okay, it's going to melt everybody's little heart right now. Look at this little thing. Everybody say, aww. Aww. Does this sound off? Because they start talking in this one. Okay. <coughs> Here's the part I want you to see. This part here, when they do this, this is how you've heard people say that possums eat lots of ticks. This is how they get rid of the ticks. 
They're walking through the forest and they're like a little tick sponge. So as they walk along, ticks get on them just like they get on you and your dog and your cat and everything else. But me, the dog, and the cat don't clean as thoroughly as possums do. So it goes through all of its hair with this little, its little back feet and then we'll chew everything off of there that's in there. And that's how they get rid of any dirt that's in their fur and any ticks or fleas or any of that that's in there. As long as they can catch it once it's on their little claws, they'll eat it. So we find a healthy possum that comes in. <clears throat> Sometimes we'll get one that's been hit by a car. They very rarely have ticks from like here down. They might sometimes have them around their eyes where they can't quite get to so well. But they're usually, as long as they're healthy, they're fairly clean. And they don't have a lot of um, ticks and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> what else was I talking about there? Oh, um, there was somebody that said at one point that they ate 95% of the ticks that got on their body. Snoops got a hold of this and said, hey, I want to check that out. And they did some kind of whatever they do to discover this. I don't know how they figured it out, how they counted ticks on possums. But they came up with it was actually somewhere around 97.6% of the ticks. And so they figured that on that statistic, you could say that having a possums around can reduce the chances of Lyme's disease in your area, depending on the size of the population of possums, which I thought was interesting. Also, <clears throat> They like to poo in water. This is a good prey thing. They're a prey animal. They don't want something knowing where they are. So they poo in the stream. Stream washes poo away. Nobody, no predators know where they're living. So when you have them in your house, they'll typically go in a place um, that's wet. Even this little head trauma one goes in a wet spot, so it's easy to clean up after. But being a prey animal, this also helps them to stay safe from predators. So they are not dirty, that's busted. They're actually cleaner than, we've got four cats, and the possums are way cleaner than the cats. One of them in particular. <laughs> possums, go ahead. If you put a little tank of water out, will they get in it and poop? They may. Um, they'll probably drink it, because water is sometimes one of the things they have trouble finding that people don't think to put out. They put out cat food or whatever, but they don't always put out water, but they may poo on in it right there. Well, I have a bird bath on the ground. Mm -hmm. I have poo in there. That's yeah. probably possums. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have some friends in your yard. <clears throat> possums carry diseases. What do you think? Yeah. yeah, everybody carries diseases. You and me have diseases. Cats, dogs, horses, cows. Everybody's got diseases. However, they are not hosts to rabies. Their body temperature is too low. Their body temperature is around 93, 94 degrees. The rabies virus is most happy around 101 to 104 degrees, somewhere in there, which is more the range of cats and dogs. So in order for an opossum to carry the rabies virus, they have to be sick enough with a fever high enough for long enough without dying to be a successful host for the rabies virus to hang out in there. So they don't carry rabies um, as a general rule. And there's another one. And distemper, the same thing. Um, body temperature is too low for them to carry distemper. So when I take Layla to the vet, he wouldn't even give me a rabies shot for her. He said that there's no point in it. There's no reason to give her a rabies shot because she's not going to have rabies unless she's sick. And if she's sick, you're going to bring her back here. And so it's not going to get that far. So they don't carry that kind of stuff. Um, but they do have, they do obviously carry disease just like cats and dogs, raccoons, foxes. Go ahead what their normal body temperature is? Around 94 degrees. So fact, they do carry diseases, but they don't carry things like rabies and distemper. So from a rehabber standpoint, if you're going to have animals that carry rabies, like uh, raccoons, foxes, that kind of stuff, it's a totally different permitting system, all that kind of stuff. Possums are immune to snake venom. Anybody heard that one? They are, in fact, immune to pit viper venom, and they are one of the only mammal predators that actually seek out and will prey on venomous snakes in our area. So if you have got a possum under your deck, you're probably not going to have venomous snakes on your deck. And basically what happens, we've seen this happen through the rehab. They come in with two little blisters on them somewhere. These two little blisters just kind of pop and go away. 
That's it. That's all that happens. They're completely immune to the venom of pit vipers. Although I'm not going to say if one was sick or old enough, it may do something to them. But we have seen it just be two little blisters. They pop, they go away. Everything's good. Um, they're being studied by medicine for the snake venom and how, how it's counteracted. And they also don't get... Um, there's several cancers that they just don't get, and even when given to them, they counteract. So their immune system is different. It's something that, that's been studied by science. So you say they predate uh, on to uh, pit vipers or venomous snakes. Do they also eat other snakes? I believe they eat other snakes as well, okay. but I, I know that they eat um, the pit vipers, and it's something they actually hunt out as far as the stuff that I was reading up on to find out. But I'm sure they would eat other snakes as well. Do they actually kill the snake? They do. And they don't look for a dead one. No, well, they, they would eat a dead one as well, but they will hunt for and kill the snakes. And I have seen videos of this, and uh, it's amazing how fast they move in that short little grabbit phase because the ones that I have are just not that fast. <laughs> and so I'm going, wow, okay, y'all need some exercise. But um, it's on YouTube if you want to look them up and stuff, but they do actually hunt and eat the venomous snakes, the pit vipers in our area. That, that one happens to be a cotton mouth. That was a good picture. So that one is a fact. Opossums are a nuisance species. We hear this all the time. If you talk to DNR, they will tell you that possums are a nuisance species. This is not true. They are a hugely important part of our ecosystem. Um, they are part of, well, they help call them here, <clears throat> secondary consumers, which means they're hunters. So in this case, they're talking about eating the ticks, fleas, snakes, all that kind of stuff. But they are also decomposers, which are down on the bottom or however you start the cycle all over again. Most of the time they're out in the road getting hit by a car because they're cleaning up some other roadkill that was out there. So these guys are opportunistic scavengers. They can and will eat anything, like anything, anything. And so um, they definitely help clean up our environment, get rid of some of that yuck that nobody else is going to clean up and get rid of. And uh, the way their bodies are made with their metabolism, they can actually live off of pretty much nothing. My first um, educational ambassador that I had was Haley. And Haley was, they thought, over three years old, which is very old for a wild opossum. And she came in, some kids had seen her fall down a stream bank into the stream. And they went and got their parents. Their parents called the possum's pouch. They went and picked her up. And Connie was leaving for vacation like the next day. And she said, can you just take Haley and watch her and make sure that there's nothing wrong with her that I'm not just seeing right off. And so Haley had been eating bird seed and dirt. I know this because that's what she was pooping. Um, she was blind in both of her eyes and was real thin, but was still getting around. She obviously wasn't doing awesome, but she was subsisting on bird seed and dirt. And so she was getting whatever nutrients she could just out of the soil that was around. So they will eat anything and they definitely help to clean up our environment. And a big part of that is getting rid of those ticks. So that one's busted. So, um, go ahead. Uh, what is it that the DNR thinks? Why does the DNR think that they're a nuisance species then? Uh, probably because people call them and say, can you please get rid of this possum that's under my house? Um, they are a fur bearer as far as a hunting season goes, but most people aren't trapping for fur bearers anymore. And so it's not a game species and it's not a cute species. Therefore, it's a nuisance species is all that I can come up with. But along with that, um, they're, they'll tell you, um, I had a discussion with a DNR person. He said, they're a nuisance species. They're overpopulated. We just have so many of them. I said, really, how many do we have? Because I have been looking to try to find any data anywhere on possum populations. And I have not found anything. And he said, well, you know, I don't really know. <laughs> and I said, well, see, that's where I'm coming from. You can't tell me that we have an overpopulation when we really don't know how many there are. And so to me, that would be an interesting field of study to find out, do we have an overpopulation of possums? Or not. I'm guessing like pretty much everybody else out there with declining space and declining habitat, we probably have declining numbers of opossums as well. But we've got studies on squirrels and beavers and chipmunks and groundhogs and crows and all that, but there aren't studies on opossums. Opossums make great pets. 
This is uh, over spring break. Layla went camping with us. We were at um, Hunting Island State Park. I was very surprised that they allowed me to bring a possum in. But she is federally licensed, and I, I tried to wow them with all of my stuff. And so sent them. I had to have an itinerary approved by the... Um, by the FDA and stuff like that. And so I sent it all to him, hoping it would look official enough for them to let us bring her. And I'll go into why I had to take her camping. But um, so possums make great pets. what I do? I hit the wrong button. Yeah. I hit something. No, 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 you did. This computer's been Yeah, you just click in there somewhere. Here you go. This is fact and busted. Wild possums need to be wild possums. That's what they're designed to do. That's where they are happiest. That's what they are best at doing. They are not going to be happy inside as a wild possum. So in rehab, the goal is always release. We take these little guys, they're orphans or they're injured. We raise them and release is always the goal. However, somebody like Layla, who has got brain damage and stuff like that, it would just be darn right cruel to stick her back outside again. She wouldn't make it. And so the non-releasables that are non-releasable for a reason, they can make good pets. Not all of them do. Some of the ones that are non-releasable are still mean grumpy and would love to be wild but they just can't for one reason or another so they are also taken care of but some of them um, the ones that need a home can be good pets they poo in one spot they don't make noise um, that kind of stuff but any wild animal needs to be a wild animal and release is always the goal so Rehab, the other side of the coin here. We've talked a little bit about possums and what they do. We've busted some myths and looked at what's true. So, rehab. Rehab, um, a lot of people always think of the babies, the cute little guys. And here's how it works. This is, this is one from my house. This is the, about the size that we can start rehabbing them. This one was probably about 10 grams. And so you get them in that size and you go, well, this is going to be a lot of work, but we can do it. So this involves two hour, every two hour round the clock feedings. Because in mom, well, in mom's pouch, they've got that teeth that they have swallowed that's given them a constant drip of, form of milk all the time. And so unless you've got absolutely nothing going on or don't even go to the bathroom, you just can't provide that. So every two hours around the clock and you start getting stupid after a couple of weeks of this and then they finally, and here's, here's the tube feeding. This is actually Beth for that you knew Beth. That's her hand tube feeding that little guy there. So you take a tube and you just run it right down into their little belly and you feed them a specific amount. We've got charts in the National Opossum Society that says how much they need to get and every how often. And then eventually they get to be big enough where they start eating on their own. Hooray! And you finally start to get some sleep. Um, they, they do best if, with more than one. It's always a more successful release if you've got more than one. But opossums will take in other babies. So if you've got some that come in, even though they're different litters, as long as they're approximately the same size, you can just stick those little buggers together and they're pretty happy. As a rehabber, we're weighing them all the time. You need to make sure that they're gaining weight and not losing weight. If you have one that's not gaining or is losing, there's a problem somewhere. So we got to try to figure out what's going on. Um, as they continue to get bigger, they love a wheel. At my house, during about this time of the year, you just hear squeak, 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 all night long. They love a wheel. And it's great exercise for them, and it's good prep for when they're going to be running from somebody. And so it's real good, but it's always fun when they do this. Two are going one way, and one's going the other way. And then there's usually one or two on the outside yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Um, and this little guy was just too cute not to put in there. <laughs> and as they keep getting bigger and bigger, eventually they end up in a pre-release enclosure, which is outside like these little dudes right here. And we try to get them acclimated to the temperatures of outside, the smells of outside. Um, if I know where I'm going to be releasing them, I go to the release site, bring stuff back from the release site so they can get accustomed to the smells of where they're going to be, that kind of stuff. And in this um, release, pre-release pen, these little guys that have been raised from this size are so used to people, but they wild up. Possums will very often 
You don't have any contact with them. You put the food in while it's still light out. They come out at night, eat their food. You clean up after them once they go back to bed. And you have them out there for a couple of weeks and then you have to give them some medication before release and you open that door and wake them up instead of a little cheese that you used to get, you get the and you're going, great, these guys are ready to be released, they're doing good. So we keep them until they're about three pounds. At this point, they're chubby enough to allow them to have um, the fat stores that they need to be able to learn how to survive in the wild and get along. They are um, not territorial. So as far as releasing back into the wild, opossums are one of the most successful species in that because they're not going to get chased off by other opossums unless they're trying to move into somebody else's burrow or something like that or bump into somebody that's not happy to see them. But they don't have a territory. So they, we have several places that have allowed us to release. And um, so we take them there. It's always somewhere with running water and a stream, that kind of stuff. But around three pounds, they are then released. I always send them out with little backpacks with cell phones and cheese so they can call me when they want to come home. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> you have them in the wheel. Do, are they friendly to each other? Do they, play, they are. Do they play like kids? They do not. Um, they don't, and that's one of the things with having opossums as, as a pet is it's hard to find things that will keep them mentally stimulated because they don't play. So like my other, this one doesn't have a mental to stimulate, but my other one, um, I have snuffle pads and stuff like that. I bring in stuff from outside. Anything to do, I have one section of her enclosure that, that um, I just have stuff in there to keep her brain stimulated. I have something different in there every night. Uh, one of the things she loves, I put little, little cups in with a grape underneath some of them and she'll knock over just the ones with grapes under them. It's great. <laughs> but it's hard to come up with stuff to keep them stimulated because they don't play. They're all about survival. Their lives are short. They've got hard lives and it's just all about survival. But the little ones, they run in the wheel and that's about all they do for play. But it is so fun to watch. Any other questions about raising babies before I move on to the next one? Yes. So it says raising orphans, and I've mm -hmm. got some children here, so maybe keep it G. But uh, mm -hmm. so why are why are why do you have such a rehab issue? Is it because the mothers are dying, or is it do they kick them out? No, these are hit by car. Typically, okay. hit by car, or somebody says, um, like as they get bigger around this size we see them orphans because mom is getting food something scares mom mom the mom bus takes off and somebody forgot to get on and so um that's usually how we end up with babies good question yes do they recognize you later on i don't think so i mean after we release yeah. i don't think so um they yeah. may by smell but they're, they definitely wild up and become wild out. I had the first litter that I did, I had one little guy. He was a little failure to thrive, and he was about a third the size of his siblings. And I kept saying to the people I worked with, he is not going to be releasable. He's never going to grow. He's teeny tiny. They said, just be patient. And I thought they were insane. And all of a sudden, he grew. And he got to be bigger, but he had been handled so much as a baby because of having to get more food in him, get more food in him, get more food in him. And um, he was the one, I don't know if any of you have ever rehab, but there's always one that when people walk into the room, it comes out and it's like, hi. <laughs> and that was him. He wanted to be held, wanted to have the attention. I was like, he is so non-releasable. But I put him out with his brothers in the pre-release pen. And I could not believe it, but he wowed up just like they did. I could not believe it. Do you ever use a, a female possum to nurse? Yes. Opossums are extremely good surrogates. They will take in anybody. However, they have to have the working teats. Like I can't, like Layla would not be able to nurse other babies. However, I can put babies in with Layla and she will lick them and clean them and tuck them in under her chin and do the best she can with them. Um, the, and the babies will take in anybody. And I've even had bigger moms that are no longer nursing. And you have an orphan come in that's the same size that missed the mama bus. Put him in there. Um, usually we'll do a little scent thing. Like I'll have him sleeping on a blanket and I'll put that blanket in with them and vice versa. And put him in while everybody's sleeping. So during the day. And I have never had a problem with putting them in. You just kind of got to be a little careful about it. But opossum moms are very willing to take in the other babies that are around. Yes? Is it true that baby possums stick to their mother's backs? 
They have, they have grabby feet. And you'll see when I get um, Layla out, she hangs on tight. And they hang on like that um, when they're asleep, when they're awake, because otherwise they get left behind. So they don't stick like Velcro, but they hang on really tight. When you've got babies, they get all up in your hair, and it is like impossible to get those little buggers out of your hair, because that's what they do. They hang on tight. Good question. I'll have to put that in my myth section. That's a good one. Go ahead. Um, in the wild, how old are they when they first come out of the pouch? I and mean, I assume they go back and forth. For they do go back and forth for a while. Um, usually, it's about the time that they've got full fur and their eyes are open. So they're about two and a half months old at that point. And they do come in and out for quite a while. And then as they get to be really big, mom will sometimes park them somewhere, go get something to eat and come back. So there is a phase where mom might be out and there are babies somewhere else once they're getting bigger. But um, it gets to the point where somebody just wanders off and mom calls and they go, yep, I'm good, see ya. And it's way smaller than what we would do as a rehabber, but they're used to that wildlife and so they're, they're out there doing their thing. Yes? Uh, I kind of have two. Uh, the first one is you said that they hadn't uh, studied the population or the wildlife population of possums the way they study various other animals. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why they haven't, if they, if they collected data on the other animals, why not possums? Why? That's what I keep asking them. And for some reason, possums have a bad rap and people are just not interested is the only, the only thing that I have heard the, back. The second question I have is, you said that possums they were, you said they were migrating due to mm -hmm. climate change and I guess maybe habitat loss. And habitat loss, uh-huh. Included in that. Um, do, you know, do they know how long it takes them to move from one location to another when a situation like that? Or? It would be over generations oh, right. because there are some now in uh, Connecticut and Vermont and stuff like that and there were not um, there before but over because they only lived for a year and a half to two years in the wild. They're not going to be able to truck their little feet all the way up there in that time. So it would just be over generations. They would progressively move. Good question. Anybody else? Yes? How do they tolerate the cold? They get frostbite on their little ears and their little feet and their tails. They're not really designed to be there, but apparently they are. So my guess is they're either going to adapt or die. And they are adaptable, so we'll see what happens. So they, have, they find a little den or something? Or? Um, yeah, they do, and they carry stuff in with their tail. They'll find a burrow or a hole that somebody else has left, and they carry stuff in with their tail and make, make it as cozy as they can. That's, that's why they migrated. That's why they you know, go to warmer climates. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're going, they're going north, away, north and west, and so they're getting colder and colder. Yes? I have two questions. You said they don't live very long in the wild. I want you to know how long and how long if they are taken care of. <laughs> and secondly, how often do they have babies per year? Okay, good questions. In the wild, the average lifespan is a year and a half to two years. In captivity, um, three years is normal, but they can live four years, five years as a really old opossum. The one that I retired, my Kalen is three. And um, starting around Thanksgiving, I could tell she was starting to have some older age issues. They call it going down in the rear. Her back legs don't work quite as well as they used to. She doesn't get around quite as well as she used to. Um, I used to take her out for about an hour every night at dusk and take her for a walk, and she loved it. It got to the point where I would take her out. She'd go like this. And sit back down at the door. Like, I'm done, thanks. So I got her a stroller, so she still goes for walks every day, but she's in the stroller. So, um. <laughs> Why do they think they don't live as long as other animals of that size? Just how it is, just how they are. I don't, I don't really know. I know the males are prone to congestive heart failure, but I don't know if that's the case in the wild or if it's more something that happens just in captivity. But. Just a short, rough life. And then, um, what was your other question? How often do they have babies? Okay, good. And how many? How many? Okay, they can have up to 13. They can give birth to more than 13, but only 13 can survive because they only have 13 teats and they, they latch onto that and don't come off until their mouth is finished developing to where they can open it and let go. So they can have up to 13, and they typically 
have two litters a year, but we have started to see a third litter in the year. So we get babies in pretty late sometimes, but usually two to three. What is their gestation period? Uh, nine days. <laughs> so that's why they're born like little lima beans with feet. Yeah, but the, that's, just, that's just till they get out to the Right. Yep, nine days inside, no placenta, so it's just nine days and they come on out. And then how long before they get out of it? Before they're out of the pouch? Um, about three months. Two and a half, three months. How does the mother walk around with all those babies in there? <laughs> they're designed short and squat and pretty strong. They, cling on to mama. they do. They, cling on. they just hang on with those little feet. So another side of rehab besides the babies is like here's a mom with babies. You can see her on there. Um, she was hit by a car, but other than having to heal up, she's okay. So we give her a safe place to heal up. Her babies stay with her as long as she is able to take care of them. And uh, when the babies are weaned, we will return the babies, we'll release the babies. And if mom isn't healed yet, we'll, we will wait and release mama after she is healed. So it depends on who's ready to go, how all that works. Um, we give them a safe place to heal and recuperate. This little guy had some surgery, had some broken legs, so that kind of stuff can be done. Um, the, this is a little guy getting ready for release. We have people that trap. So if you're thinking, hey, I'd like to help out with rehab, but you know, I just can't swing the every two hours, 24 hours a day for three months, can't do it. Okay, none of us can. It just gets a little insane. But um, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. One of the things that we're always looking for people to do is transport. Somebody will call and say, I've got this possum, it's hit by a car, I've got it in a cardboard box, what do I do with it? Well, I'm at home feeding baby possums every two hours around the clock. I can't truck up to wherever to pick up this possum. So if somebody's willing to pick up a possum and take it to a rehabber, that's a huge help to those of us that are feeding possums every two hours. Um, somebody that's willing to drop off traps. My neighbor's got this possum under their house, they're going to kill it. Can you move it? I actually had a neighbor that came, um, it was just a couple weeks ago, they came over to our house one Sunday afternoon, knocked on the door, and he says, I have a possum in the trap in the back of my car, what do I do with it? I said, uh, I don't know what's going on. He said, well, the neighbor said that this possum's getting into his chicken coop and he's going to kill it. And he had met, they had met, he had several kids that came over and met Layla. And he said, so I talked with the kids and my wife and we said to the neighbor, if we go buy a trap, will you let us trap this possum and take it away? And he said, okay, sure, you've got a week. So we put the trap out and they, they were awesome. They put the trap out around dusk and they checked it every 15 minutes until they went to bed and then they closed it because they didn't want the possum to be in the trap and scared and try to chew its way out, wrecking its teeth, all that kind of stuff. So then the next, the next morning, he said his wife gets up at 3 in the morning. So she got up at 3, set the trap and checked the trap every 15 minutes. And then at daytime, they closed it. Then the next afternoon, they set it at dusk. And about, he said two kids later, he, they had about five kids, they were doing shifts. He said about two kids later, the kid came back and said, there's a possum in there. And so they showed up and we took the possum down back of my house and released the possum perfectly healthy, hadn't even been in the cage and the trap long enough to get scared, try to chew out. Released the possum, she wandered all off, everything was good. So um, people to set traps, pick traps back up. Um, people who have property to where we could release possums on there. People that want to release possums. If you've got a place that a possum could just recuperate and you don't mind feeding them medicine. Um, people that do pre-release. This is a pretty easy job. You just have a pre-release pen set up. You give them food in the morning. Well, give them food in the evening, clean it up in the morning, and you don't even have to touch them. So there's all kinds of stuff. If you're interested in helping, we'll find you something. Yes? Is your permit allow transporting across state lines? No. Okay. Cannot trans Mine does. I mean, I can transport her across state lines, but we can't, like, but we can't no. In South Carolina and release it. No. 
so yeah, North Carolina, we'd have to do North Carolina and North Carolina. And I'm not really sure what the laws are in North Carolina, but I know what they are here. They don't, but um, they don't, but it's good to work within the law. Yes, she's got a little license plate, but seriously, they got a little tattoo. I'm from South Carolina. Yes. On the one that looks severely injured. This little guy here. Mm -hmm. What's your protocol for making the decision on euthanizing? Since I only have such a short life. Yes. And that's going to take some A time while to heal, heal, and then whether or not it will be releasable. The ladies that do the possums pouch, they'll give everybody a chance. And even if it's non-releasable after this is all done, they'll give it a home, keep it warm, fed, and everything else until it is done. But if this is a possum that is in pain and is not happy, they will euthanize. So that's, that's what they do. I do the education part and babies, and I babysit. One other, when, yes. when you put traps out for them, do you cover them? Yes. We give a whole little instruction sheet of how I to do it. But um, even then, sometimes they'll try to chew out and it wrecks their teeth. It's not good. And then they become non-releasable. And so then you've got another possum. Um, release is always the goal. These were some that were released along the Tiger River. We've got a release site there. And um, usually they just pop right on out of there. And this little guy is already looking quite, see how dark that one is? Somebody's talking about, yeah. So that's just a different color phase. They do come in different colors. But um, they'll usually come right out and follow their nose and walk away and sometimes even turn around and hiss at you. Kind of like, yeah, whatever, yeah. see you bye. <laughs> and uh, you know that they're, they're ready to go. Uh, sometimes they're just munching on stuff as they go and you know that these guys are gonna do just fine. Doesn't mean we don't cry like babies every time, but you know they'll do just fine. So, any questions about those guys before we get on to Layla? Because I can't believe it's already seven o'clock. I've been rambling on for an hour about possums, but you mentioned earlier about coyotes, but uh, what what yeah, for, what uh, feeds on possums? Everything. Uh, <laughs> coyotes um, are our major predator, and then um, when they're young just about anything that can catch them, but hawks, owls, that kind of stuff as well. Um, some snakes when they're younger, that kind of stuff, and cars. So, Layla, this is, she loves a blanket. She loves to be under a blanket, so there she is. There's my little Layla. I got Layla on January 31st. This was Layla when she was found. She was found in a barn on um, December 16th. We got a call saying, we've got this possum in the barn. It's out during the day. It's not acting normal. It walks a little bit, and then it falls over. So they went and picked her up, and she was starving. Um, I don't know if you can see there, but her face is all sunk in here. And um, so they picked her up, and they tube fed her for about a month. And then all of a sudden, she said, you know what? Hey, I think I'm going to eat, and I'm going to live. And so she started eating, and that's when they noticed that she had some other issues, mainly that she has head trauma. Um, this little squished-in eye is one of the indicators of that, but also her behavior. This is a completely wild opossum, and you can just pick her up and walk around with her. Not normal. And so um, at that point, they said, okay, we've got an opossum that we're going to need to find housing for for the rest of its life. And I was retiring my, my Kalen. And so they called me up and said, I think we've got a possum for you. And I said, perfect. I'll take her on trial because I was thinking about getting a little one and raising it up. Well, the trial lasted about two hours and I was sold. So, so I've got Layla. So anyway, she was starving to death. But before the starving to death, she had sustained a leg break. And this is really hard to see, but that's her little thummy toe. And this is her little foot. And this is about here on her foot. It was broken and there's a teeny tiny little bone spur that's still sticking out. And so um, that says there's nothing much we can do about that without causing her further trauma just the way it is. So she sustained a broken leg and it healed before we got her. She also sustained a broken jaw that had healed before we got her. So her jaw kind of goes like this. So even now, she can't eat normal possum food. She can't eat anything. I've got to um, kind of make sure that she's got soft food. And so this is probably why she was starving. Between the broken leg and the broken jaw, she's not doing so good. She also had a bone infection. This is directly down from the break. 
And this is why she was camping with us. She was on antibiotics, pretty strong antibiotics, to counteract this bone infection. And I didn't want to just leave her with a pet sitter. By the way, she's got diarrhea and has to take this nasty medicine. See you, bye. <laughs> so, um, so she went camping with us, which was a lot of fun. But you can see from the beginning, there's this huge lump and the hole. And then this was actually took that picture while we were camping. So it's all healed up now. There's still a bump there, which is bone material that kind of came in the, the calcification. But um, that would also make her not want to eat, which is part of why she was so thin. The head trauma. <laughs> See her little squishy eyeball? <laughs> that either is from the site of the injury or sometimes the brain swelling does some damage to that eye. So they, they're telling me she's blind in that eye, which I would believe. The other eye she may be blind in or it just may not be getting through to her brain because she does bump into stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that would bother a regular opossum don't bother Layla because of this head trauma. So the broken leg, she would be releasable because of that. That's healed up. That would have been fine. The broken jaw, she's unable to eat food like a regular possum. That would make her non-releasable. The brain trauma, where she's a wild possum and I can pick her up and hold her, that makes her non-releasable. <laughs> she doesn't have a clue in the world. Yes? That ear, is that her, is that its color or is that? Yeah, her ear is a little pink on the edge. The babies have pink ears when they're born and they get progressively more and more dark as they get older and some of them retain a little bit of pink and some of them don't. Just kind of depends. How old is she now? They think she is about a year old now, but because usually the way they age them is by the wear on their teeth, but because she wasn't eating, she could be two, but probably not three. But we think she's about a year. So, <laughs> she has this backpack that she loves to be in. I think that she has kind of regressed um, because of the head trauma. She loves to be in a pack and I carry her around. So, let's get little Layla out here for a minute. Oh my gosh, she's sleeping in. She's got her little, this means she's happy. She's got a little happy hands. Come here, Layla. So here's my little Layla, and hopefully she'll stay sleepy and not decide that she needs to move around. But we're going to go into some opossum adaptations, things that make opossum opossum. This is really scientific, so hang on to your seats for this one. <laughs> so we've got opossum anatomy 101. First thing here we've got is insulation floof. So she's got fur that helps her to stay warm. And on the inside, she's got finer fur. Like a cat or a dog, they do shed some of this winter stuff out if they're wild. They do have some that comes out um, as the season goes on. And then also it kind of floofs up a little bit to help them to stay cooler in the summer. So that's the insulation floof. The brain case. On this little girl, the brain case did the best it could, but it wasn't enough. But they do have a, um, a ridge on their skull that tries to help to protect their eyes and is also where muscles are attached that helps them to chew through bones and stuff like that that a lot of other animals wouldn't be able to do. The listen pedals. <laughs> Those are their little ears. And they use the listen pedals to hear what's going on around them. They're very attuned to sounds, her not so much. But um, they do make sounds and communicate that way. Mama possums will click or ch chew at their babies, and the babies answer. Um, I have Kaylin, I had some babies I was babysitting, and she was clicking to them, and they were chewing to her, and they make those little tiny noises, and so they're cueing into where the babies are or what's going on around them. Um, beady peepers, they do have little beady peepers. Their eyesight is not very good, but they don't use it for a whole lot. They more rely on their other senses to help them know what's going on around them. Specifically, the Osh nozzle. <laughs> you can hear her sniffing around. Um, like, would take Kalen for a walk. Kalen would just follow her nose. She would just go wherever she was going by what her nose was telling her. She sniffs a lot. But it just doesn't go through. The little brain is too scrambled. Um, but she sniffs, but she doesn't follow it. So if I put like a piece of cheese in front of her face, she's just like, whereas Callan would be like, yeah, that's mine. Thank you. And so um, it just kind of depends on this little one's brains. The wire, the sense wires, they do do a lot with their 
little whiskers. It tells them a lot about what's going on around them, how big a hole is that they're trying to go in somewhere. So they get a lot of information from there. And the hunger shoot. Um, this little one, in spite of all of her difficulties, loves to eat. She will eat anything. She is a good eater. In captivity, they have to have a very specific diet, especially when they're babies, to ward off metabolic bone disease. And that incorporates a lot of vegetables. She will eat her vegetables. She will even eat canned spinach. And I don't know a single other living thing that will eat canned <laughs> spinach. So, um, so that's, that's a good thing with her. But in the wild, they will eat anything. In captivity, they do have a very specific diet that we have to follow to try to ward off this metabolic bone disease. Um, starfish, are, go ahead. They are omnivores? They are omnivores. So what do you feed them besides the vegetables? In captivity, she gets mostly vegetables and then a teeny little bit of protein and a little bit of fruit. Um, in the wild, they get tons of exercise trying to find their food. In captivity, not so much. And so it's a specific diet because of that. But when they're younger, um, there has to be correct ratios or their bones can't develop right. And their bones develop too fast, end up having holes in them, and it's extremely painful. But this happens really often when people get these cute little buggers. And, well, they love hot dogs. Yeah, I'm sure they do. But uh, they can't eat just hot dogs and be healthy. And so that's when we get them in. They're going, it doesn't walk right anymore, no, because its bones aren't developed. If it's caught soon enough, this can be reversed but not really cured and so feeding them a specific diet as a baby is very important um starfish hands they've got little hands can you see her little okay she's hanging on little starfish hands looks like ours but on the back has she got a foot sticking out she's got a an opposable thumb how about this side she's got an opposable thumb can you see it there where's her foot sniff She's got a little opposable thumb that doesn't have a that doesn't have a claw on it on this little opposable thumb. Okay, I'm done messing with your feet. <laughs> poop launcher, yeah, they poop. What goes in has to come out. Now she's gonna want to walk. Now I woke her up and she wants to walk. And here's the noodle. It is opposable. It does wrap. Okay, you're making a liar out of me. It does wrap around stuff and she can hang on with it. Are you going to find a dark corner and go away? <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to say about the rumpus tumpus, other than that they're kind of chubby, and so they make great food for other wild animals if somebody's going to try to eat her. They're little chubby um, critters on feet, and they don't move very fast. This is pretty normal. But they grip really well. I mean, they'll grip onto anything, including the tail. Yes. They'll grip on it, all, all kinds of stuff. 